like you to engage with me in a short reflective activity. Are you ready? Okay. Unless you're driving or handling a sharp object, close your eyes and imagine that you're holding a baby in your arms. The baby is awake, but quiet and happy, and seems to be mostly interested in looking into your eyes and listening to you babble the sweet nothings that babies love to hear. Now think, on which elbow is the imaginary baby's head resting? If you answered left, congratulations, because you're part of the 90% of people who cradle babies that way. Even the large primates, gorillas, chimpanzees, and the like, display this cradling behavior. The question is why? It turns out that science is a good explanation, and it isn't related to handedness, as even left-handed people tend to cradle on the left. It has to do with the biological nature of social interaction. The right side of the brain, which has primary responsibility for outward-facing social perception and behavior, controls the left side of the body, including the left hemisphere of the face. The left side of the face is larger and more expressive than the right. By cradling on the left, babies are getting more stimulation from their caregiver. This social stimulation goes by another name, learning. The holding, looking, and cooing is the earliest form of learning that provides the social attachment and capacity for learning on which the baby's future development depends. Good early care by parents and other caregivers is among the most important factors in later success. Our guest today on Hardly Working is AEI resident scholar Catherine Stevens. Dr. Stevens has a PhD in education policy from Columbia, has worked extensively in K-12 education. Her research at AEI focuses on early childhood development, and she's the author of multiple important reports, including the one we're focusing on in this conversation, Workforce of Today, Workforce of Tomorrow, Business Case for High Quality Child Care, which explores the way in which reliable, quality child care can help parents find and keep employment and lays the foundation for the next generation of workers. Catherine Stevens, thank you for joining us on Hardly Working. Thanks so much, Brent. Great having you. You know, it's it's funny because here at AEI, the building that we're in has kind of an open floor plan. And Catherine and I are in the same area. We can't see each other, but we face each other in our offices. And we've that's been one of the great joys of my time and being here to be able to just be in casual conversation with Catherine about her work, which I find absolutely fascinating and looking at early childhood and child care and related issues. She's got a wonderful report that we're going to talk about, which is Workforce of Today, Workforce of Tomorrow, the business case for high quality child care. We're going to get there. But that is not by any stretch of the imagination the sum of your work at AEI, that you do some really amazing, you've done some really amazing work on the topic of kind of early development in general, early human development. I'd like you to start there. Mm -hmm. What happens when a baby is born Mm -hmm. in terms of from, from that moment, maybe even before they're born, but certainly from the moment of birth, Things are on an explosive trajectory of mm-hmm. development that we that we need to pay attention to. And I'd like you to talk about that because I'm absolutely fascinated with the topic. And I think it we're going to get to how that connects to workforce, but it's it's critical. So I want you to lay the groundwork for us. So as a, a kind of a framing for that, I just want to mention that my background, is, as you know, is actually in K-12. And I, like most people in our society, spent years and years focusing on K-12 as, as kind of the key development pipeline for new generations. And K-12 is kindergarten through 12th grade. Kindergarten through 12th grade, our right. school system. Right. And increasingly now, actually, pre-K through 12th grade. So when I arrived at AAI to do early childhood five years ago, I started out focusing on pre-K as early childhood education. That was what, what how I saw it. That's how a lot of people see it. Coming from my K-12 school kind of perspective. And over the last several years, as I've been working in this area, what I've arrived at is exactly what you just introduced, which is that, in fact, the most crucial period of human development occurs long before children enter school, and in fact, a substantial proportion of it long before they can even walk. This is something that people are increasingly aware of, but less than we would wish. What science, a really exploding body of science, has established is that starting at birth, 
a baby is rapidly and continuously learning in response to the to that child's environment and that what that means is that the the baby's brain is literally constructed from the ground up starting at birth so when a baby is born we you and i here have about 100 billion brain cells called neurons those brain cells only function because they are connected, wired together through trillions of connections. That's why they work. When a baby is born, that baby has all, just about all 100 uh, billion brain cells. However, at birth, those cells are very poorly connected. So the process of learning, when people say babies are learning starting at birth, what that literally means is that the connections called synapses, the trillions and trillions of connections called synapses between the brain cells that wire them together, that enable our brains to function, are developed at a rate of one million per second. Yeah, we need to just ponder that, you know, a million per second um, from birth onward or for, for those for in this in this period of very rapid development. Exactly. And once you start thinking about this, next time you see a baby, you can see that it is designed for absorbing input from the environment. It's head is enormous in proportion to the rest of its body. Its eyes are huge in proportion to its head. Its ears, it's designed to be absorbing from the environment. And what the science has established is that, first of all, and this is, this is perhaps the most important aspect of early development, very young children, infants and toddlers, learn in the context of their social relationships. Without social relationships, there is essentially no learning. We are hardwired to be highly social beings. Mm -hmm. So that's, that is one critical principle. Another is it's like a jungle where the paths that you walk on are the ones that become, become clear. So the, the experiences that, that children have are laying down the pathways in their, in their brains. The ones they use become stronger and stronger. The ones they don't use never develop, or, or if they did de develop initially, they'll, they'll fade away. This is, for example, why it is so much easier for very young children to learn a language, any language. They can use, learn English. They can learn Spanish. They can learn Russian. They can learn Chinese. They can learn all four of those because their brains are simply laying down those connections. If, for example, a baby learns Spanish and is fluent in Spanish at age three and then moves to another country or to a different family and stops speaking Spanish, it's like a pathway in the jungle that's no longer used. The jungle grows over that pathway and the child will will later learn the spanish so let's let's go back for a second to the the idea of learning being inherently social cuz i think that that's maybe something that isn't so common in people's thinking about learning mm. you know we think about learning we right. think about that's right i've got my book i open my book i read right i absorb that information i think about it and i have and and then maybe i do something that's with right. it and i've learned it right right but you're describing a very different kind of learning. Can you just sort of go into that yep. more? But. Yeah, and I actually think that we have really over the last several decades developed a very powerful school bias in mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. So really, education means human development. The root of, of the word means development. Today, when we think about education, we don't think about human development. We think about schooling. Mm -hmm. And that's partly why when people think about early childhood education, what they think is early school. Early childhood education means early development, and that does not mean early school. This is also true, in fact, for adults. I mean, if, if you reflect on your, in your own life, you realize that there was an enormous amount of development that occurred, physical, 
social, emotional, intellectual that occurred not in school. And in fact, from birth to age 18, children spend only 20% of total waking hours from birth to 18 in school. What I think early childhood underscores for us is something that's really true throughout the lifespan, that schooling is a very narrow part of, of, of learning. Now, that's true, as I've, as I've just said, throughout the lifespan. But for very young children, it is, it's especially true. It's the way we're, we're hardwired. And, you know, you can see in the way we as adults respond to babies, they're hardwired to learn in social, in social relationships, and we're hardwired to provide those for them mm-hmm. hmm. in the way that we respond to them, the way we kind of get in their face and want to connect with them and talk, and talk to them. That's, that's, a, that's a universal instinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I was thinking about, you know, sort of my own life and my own education. I went through college, university, I got my degree, and obviously that had a big impact on me, right? So I, I learned a, a ton there. I would say, though, that in my, in my life since college, when I look back on my learning, most of the most important things that I've learned have actually been in dialogue with other people right. rather than a sort of walled off loner process, you right. know, like you're alone, you're learning. There's, right. there's a lot of that in right. life. You know, we have to study. We have to, you know, to bear down and really get into the subject matter. But in terms of framing and understanding mm-hmm. and setting course in life, so much of it has to do with the kind of conversation we're having right now, which is, let me tell you my experience. Yes. Have you respond to that? Yes. Come back to me with... Have you thought of this? Yes. You know, introduce a new idea. So there's this dialogical process. Yes. That's and as a matter of fact, the most important development in your life happened long before you got to school. Mm-hmm. So that's... In, in fact, we can't even rem- remember you, it. You can't remember that, right. Yeah. But you'll, you'll notice, for example, with infants. Infants will begin, exactly along the lines of what you were just saying, they will point to something that they want you to see. Mm-hmm. So there's a really powerful instinct to do exactly what you just said, to share an experience. Mm-hmm. You've probably seen this. Yeah. They kind of wave their hand, and when they're really young, you're not quite sure they're doing it. They get a little, a little older. They're seeing something, and they want you to look at it, too, mm-hmm. to share that experience. Right. And then what they will welcome is a conversation about what they've seen. And with a very young child who who does not yet have language, they will engage in that conversation. You'll say, oh, yeah, look at that big truck. And they will, they'll make, they'll, they'll talk back, even if you can't understand what they're saying. So that process, which you just described, is just fundamental to, to, to humans. Another place I think we're just, re, we're just coming to understand more clearly, another dimension of this is when that kind of, of, of socially driven, interac- interactive driven learning certainly shapes people from a social and emotional point of view. It also, however, shapes cognitive development. So what the research shows is that it's not the number of words a baby hears that's shaping their language ability, which is fundamental, by the way, to, to all of cognition. It's the back and forth. That engaging in that back and forth prior to 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 being able to to, to speak in a way that anyone else can understand right. you. That's so interesting because it's, you know, it's like, well, if a baby just needs to hear a lot of words, I can turn on a an iPod or I can turn on a speaker that can feed words to them. They can sit and listen to words all right. day long. It's not the words. It's the words embodied in this interaction. In, in, in their interaction. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So. Children under about two years old won't engage in a conversation with a screen at all or 18 months. And then after that, they can, but it has to be like a video chat. There has to be somebody who responds to them. This is sort of interesting. This is also true, by the way, of a... They've done research, some research on this in animals. Baby songbirds can't learn their song from a recording of the song. They can only learn it from an actual physical bird. So it's a very similar phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, it's, it's, and, and that's something that is, that is 
kind of counterintuitive to us. We, we, it's hard for, especially in this sort of technologically driven mm-hmm. age, it's hard for us to understand. So one of the things, the questions I get a lot are, you know, isn't there an app for this? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. and the problem is, here's the thing, it, it, they're just, there, there really are not economies of scale and shortcuts in building new humans. Yeah. For all of eternity, all of human eternity, this is this kind of interactive, social, back and forth, loving, nurturing, responsive. That's what it's always taken to develop new human beings. And that's what it that's what it takes today, regardless of other massive changes in our society. Right, because human beings have been around for 400,000 years, I think. It's really not enough time for human beings to change fundamentally. You know, like we're not... The, the human brain isn't changing very rapidly. <laughs> the external environment's changing Correct. fast. And as, a, and as a matter of fact, yeah. I think you kind of moving into the, the workforce subject, mm-hmm. it has not been 400,000 years in which there would have been the need for the brain to change this way. This is a brain change that would only have been required really since the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. Up until the early 1800s, 90%, for example, in, in the United States, like mm-hmm. 90% of Americans lived on farms. Mm-hmm. This was true throughout the world. In that setting, family and work were not divided. Mm-hmm. And as a matter of fact, your, su- your survival, your success as a, as a community would be dependent on your ability to sustain yourself. And that required an extended family effort. Whether you're actually doing farm work, say, or you are the farm wife doing the home part of that equation, your very young children, not only can they be with you, it's critical that they're with you because they're learning how to be part of, of the enterprise. So that the family nature of enterprise is how humans have operated for almost all of human history. Yeah, that's really interesting. When you think about the, how abrupt that transition was from agricultural to industrial life, it really happened over about a 50-year period. Yes. You know, 40, 50 years yes. where we moved off the farms and into the cities and into factories. And what an abrupt shift that was. That's a, Yes. I heard the other day, you know, like if, if you had a sheet of paper that, you know, regular eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and you thought of human history as being a slice of that piece of paper, it would be like some infinitesimal little right. piece of it. Right, right, right. But within that, we're only talking about even an even tinier piece. And yet all of that evolution that occurred before then is the foundation that's under that chain. Exactly. Um, Exactly. And if your listeners are interested, I actually write about that that transition Mm -hmm. from in the United States in work and family life from rural to industrial Mm -hmm. in my report, Renewing Childhood's Promise. So maybe you can link to that. Yeah, no, we'll put Um, it in the show notes. So I have actually a graph in that report showing the percentage of of families living on farms. And so there there was some of our most difficult challenges today, the stuff you work on, right? Mm -hmm. How to get people into the workforce, what to do with the kids when they are in the workforce, which we'll we'll, we'll talk about. Those were non-problems. Right. Nobody would have even known what you were talking about. As a matter of fact, the word unemployment did not even enter the dictionary until, I think, the early 20th century. It just was not a word. So, what would that mean? You know, you're part of, and so in terms of job training and being part of the workforce, that was all just built into family life. Yeah. You're, you're, you were an apprentice. You were an apprentice adult mm-hmm. from birth. In addition, families were larger. And so there were among children more of an opportunity to be, if, if you're a young, probably more often a young girl, you, you're going to be an apprentice mother mm-hmm. because you're going to be taking care of younger, younger children. So you have a, you have a, you're learning the necessary skills on the job in a secure, sort of familiar, loving environment. You're not on the outside of something trying to figure out how to get in. You're born into it. 
Yeah. So that's how our society operated for so long. That's how we're hardwired to operate. I think a lot of what we're struggling with today is coming out of the fact that that changed so rapidly, but we don't even remember that, mm-hmm. that, that, that that's occurred. Right. Somebody made this point to me recently that It was in that transition from the farm to the factory that we saw like the first widespread problems dealing with addiction, except it was alcohol. Exactly. Right. That's absolutely right. So these dense social networks of people that were living in rural areas, moving into cities and having having that whole social infrastructure that was necessary yeah. to live was gone, yep. right? And so it had to be recreated in an urban setting that happened in uneven ways and people yep. who were isolated in ways that they had never been isolated. Not only they had never been isolated before like that, but human beings had never been isolated like that before. That's right. Turned to alcohol to soothe the anxiety yep. that associated with that kind of separation. Yep. yep. That makes um, that I think that makes that makes perfect yeah, sense. Yeah. And then of course prohibition was a re, was, well, it was, was a reaction. reaction to this yeah. becoming an an epidemic problem. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And I think you know when when so now clearly not every single person worked on a farm. Some people ran stores, but this was not the the day the year of Walmart. You were not you were not an assistant manager in Walmart where you have to drop your child off at a childcare center and go to your your job at Walmart. You ran the store. So if you if you go to to less developed countries or you know very small towns, you'll see people are running their store and their their children are in the store with them. If it's a baby, it might be crawling around on the on the on the floor. Older relatives are often there helping. As I've said, many of these challenges that I focus on in particular in early childhood just don't exist in that in that setting. Yeah. We've made explicit what the importance of early childhood is. You know, we don't think about it, you know, and think about what's going on in terms of development. But your work is so great at helping us to make explicit what we assume. We know that that's critical time. We know that human beings at a young age need a tremendous amount of nurture so that and care and attention and focus on them in order to develop that that yeah. capacity. Let me just add one mean. study, kind of a study that I want to share with you that I saw recently at a, at a science conference several, like a millennia ago. And I don't remember who it was. I, it was a le- leader in whether it was, I think it was in the Roman Empire, or the Greek Empire, wanted to know whether natural human language was Latin or Greek. And they did the following experiment, because this is the sort of thing they could do in those days, a fascinating experiment, which is horrific, and we would never even think of doing it today. They literally took, I think it was 20 children away from their mothers at, 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 at birth and put them in a house together with caretaking servants who met their bodily needs, but were instructed to have no interaction with them beyond that and and in absolute silence, because their idea was that this would show what the, the children would, would naturally, I think the person, this must have been the, the Roman Empire, because the person was expecting Latin to emerge naturally. And they kept detailed records on this experiment. And what they discovered, when those children, they, by age five, the children had no language at all. They just didn't talk. They grunted. And there was subsequently many other cognitive, social, emotional disabilities that they demonstrated. So to me, that was just absolutely fascinating. Well, it reminds me of those those studies on hospitalism with babies in orphanages. Correct. They would, you know, they would take them. You know, there's this idea that we we're going to keep them separate. We're going to tend to their bodily needs, but we're not going to we're not going to interact with them. We're going to keep them from other children as well. And just the mortality rates that were associated with depriving children of of social interaction. That's exactly right. And then there's another very famous experiment, the Romanian orphanages 
which was another natural experiment that a group of U.S. researchers kind of took advantage of, which is there were enormous numbers of children being put into these orphanages. These researchers got funding to take a limited number out and put them with foster families who had been carefully selected and, and trained. What they found was that babies who were removed from the orphanage by age two in adolescence, which is where the study's at now, their brain scans were the same as children who had never been in the orphanage. After age two, two to three, adolescents who were removed subsequently at age four or age five from this or from the orphanage and placed with families, their brain scans in adolescence were different. In other words, their brains did not recover from the kind of isolation growing up in this institutional environment. So it's, a, it's similar to the language experiment. In other words, we underestimate how much the environment is shaping children's capacities, even for things that we see as so basic, like simply being able to talk. Thank you for that, because I think it, it sort of, we lay out sort of the positive case for, you know, how human beings develop. You've given us a little bit of a picture for what happens when that doesn't happen, you know, like right. some of the deficits that then arise. So I want to shift us now to your study that you did with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is entitled Workforce of Today, Workforce of Tomorrow, the Business Case for High Quality Child Care. Tell us how this idea came to you. Tell us the methodology that you used for putting the report together and what you found. So this report came out of a conversation that I had with the Education and Workforce team at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And they had initially approached me actually asking me to write a report on, on pre-K. In other words, the ostensible benefits of starting school when children starting school when they're four instead of when they're five. And by the, that point, I had been kind of immersed in the fact that four is really, from a developmental point of view, from a, K to, from a school point of view, four is very young. From a developmental point of view, four is actually quite old. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing is their department is called education and workforce. Children going to school when they're four is not supportive of the other half of what they're focused on, which is workforce. However, childcare is because a very large number of people, as you know, in this country who are working or not working need child care. In many cases, people don't work because they don't have child care. So it's always when you ask when you when you talk with workforce development professionals around the country, there are always three things that are standing in the way of people getting employment. Child care is uh -huh. first, transportation uh -huh. is second, housing is third. Right, 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 right. Right. Yes. It's just one of those things which we just kind of forget to remember. Yeah. And so the way I organized the report was looking at the two complementary dimensions of high quality child care, or the two ways in which it's important. The first one is what you've just said, that many people have to have child care, especially lower income people have to have child care in order to be able to go to work. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we invest a great deal in the K-12 schools. See, what, what do we spend on K-12? In the we, we're now spending over $700 billion. And that's federal in, or is that? That's federal, state, and local. local. So, okay. federal, for, so for all public dollars, well over $700 billion. We care about human development, but we also care a great deal about development of the future workforce. So... The nation and states, states on average, spend about a third of their general fund on K-12. One of the reasons they're, focused, they're so heavily focused on K-12 is it's widely seen as the workforce development pipeline. What we now understand from the science is that much of what's the foundation's for that development are occurring long before children enter school. And in fact, the achievement gap, which we measure in schools and try to fix in schools, emerges long before children get to school. So I want to just focus on that for a second, because I think that there is this sense that that, that early development stuff kind of take care, takes care of itself in the family, and then we right. take people into school. Yes. 
And we assume, we assume that people when they arrive in kindergarten or first grade have the capacities that they need in order to take advantage of the educational the resource, system. The resources that, that we're yeah, providing. Yeah, that we're providing. Yep. Yeah. And I think what you're suggesting is that that assumption is getting us into a lot of trouble because we're not thinking actively enough about those early years and that we should be thinking about those early years in the context of education and development and career and all of the stuff, the, the life cycle of a human being rather than just thinking of it as, well, that's just going to take care of itself and then we're going to educate them and then they're going to be fine. That's right. We, we have to. Yeah. And in fact, the K-12 system is predicated on the world we were talking about earlier that doesn't exist anymore in which children were largely raised at home in, in, in stable families and went to school when they were six or, or seven, when all of the most, the kind of the foundational development had been accomplished in the home, family, church, community setting. And they went to school on their own steam initially to learn very discrete skills reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? The three R's. That's the foundation of our system. We never envisioned that this insti these institutionalized classrooms would be able to develop children into people, to members of our society. Mm -hmm. It wasn't designed for that purpose, and it's not accomplishing it very well. As you've just said, a growing number of children, a substantial number of children, are entering kindergarten simply not ready to succeed. And what research shows is that the gaps at kindergarten persist throughout school. They don't get much bigger. And they don't get smaller. Mm. They pretty much stay the same. Mm. So part of the, I think, our mental block about this is it's like a now what, right? Mm. We're having enough problems trying to, quote, fix the schools. And this other problem seems even more amorphous. Here's the thing. It might seem that fixing the schools is an easier task, but we have abundant proof that that's not the case. Right. Because we've been fixing and fixing. Spending has, in some states, in many states, tripled, in all, all states at least doubled over the last 50 years. And achievement is not going up. So it's an illusion that that's easier to do. Now, that's not to say that this is easy, that we know what to do, because what the, how we can go about supporting ch children's earliest development, that's a tough nut to crack. But at least if we crack it, we're, we're focusing on the right, right part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, so this is part of the argument of my report, is that the research is very clear for disadvantaged children. This is, this is not true across the board. For disadvantaged children, who come from families that may be more fragile with, with fewer resources, high quality child care has a positive impact on their development. And this makes sense. The bottom line of it is children are shaped by whatever environment they're in. And if one environment is, is not adequately supportive, but they're spending a lot of time in an environment that is, that's going to have a positive impact on their development. So when you say impact, what does, what does the research tell us about those disadvantaged kids who get high quality child care? So what the research tells us is that disadvantaged children who get high quality child care in a paid child care setting become closer in development to those children who get high quality child care in their own home, right? So children need care, and that care can be provided in a home environment. That could be whether it's at home or grandma's house or a child care center. From the developmental point of view, it all boils down to the same thing. And so our goal for children just has to be to get them the maximum number of hours in the most developmentally supportive places. Businesses need workers. Those workers need child care if they're going to work. Many of the children, not all, but many of the children need a supportive early care environment. Tell me about the conversation with business around this and how has that gone in terms of making this case? I should back up again and just say the final dimension is that the investments being made in that early care 
our workforce investments for the future of the workforce, not just the existing workforce, right. but the workforce they're going to need in the future. So how has how's the response been to that conversation in the business community? So I've, as you know, I've spent quite a lot of time over the last couple of years in states talking to the business community, making this exactly this argument. And what I've found is they're enormously receptive. The business community has for decades now been heavily involved in trying to fix K-12, they see for themselves that it's not churned out as well as people had been hoping for a long time. Business people tend to have a kind of a supply chain sort of logical way of understanding systems. And so the idea of essentially improving the raw materials into the K-12 system, mm -hmm. the raw materials being the children, is really the best way to improve K-12. They already think about K-12 as, as a crucial pipeline to develop the future workforce. What I'm seeing is that it's making a great deal of sense to them that we kind of missed, the, we're missing the first early part of the pipeline, and that by focusing more on that, the rest of it is going to, is going to go much, much better. They also know that the, the cost to business, both in terms of not being in the, in the moment, not being able to find workers, turnover, absenteeism, et cetera, I think pe people are increase, increasingly realizing the impact that, that child care has on those kinds of issues as well. Mm -hmm. So my observation is that they understand that and they are eager to put the pieces together. From a policy point of view, it's challenging because the K-12 system is, is, I think, entrenched would be a fair word. It absorbs a great deal of the resources. It has a, a large number of stakeholder groups. So figuring out how to kind of shift some of that center of gravity to focus on, an, on a period of development that is, in fact, more useful to business in the short run and that makes long-term sense, that's a policy challenge hmm. that I think people are increasingly realizing is going to have to be tackled. Do you see any interesting models developing out there of businesses understanding all of this, the supply chain aspect, the, you know, the meeting the current, their current needs, and then just sort of taking it into their own hands to solve their problem locally with the idea that they're also contributing to these longer term solutions. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I think it's just very difficult without public money, right? Mm. So we spend on average about $13,000 per child in K-12. So the business community does a lot for K-12. They depend on K-12, but they can't cough up $13,000 for a child for every employee. Mm -hmm. that, that's, they, they don't do that. So mm -hmm. they have an employee with two children, three children. They're not paying for that. Without public dollars going to this, it's just not something frankly, that the business community is going to be able to handle on its own. So is there a, is there a I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about, you know, like the scale of the problem requires pub a, a public solution. Like they can't right. be, we can't privatize this. For, the, um, for low income, yeah, lower income yeah. families. Right. I think we've talked about this. Like, you know, it seems like part of the proposed solution then is that, well, we just need to put the public school system in charge of early childhood care because it's all part of the same pipeline. So why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't just extend that, extend that system out to cover all of this? I mean, we've talked about this, so I kind of know what you think about it. But tell tell me what you think about that. Yes. Yeah, you know, because if you start, if you say, all right, we need this public investment, the first thing that's going to happen is that that education system is going to turn to that and say, that's ours. Yes. We do that. Well, and actually, that's already happening. From my point of view, it's an, an appalling idea. K-12 is a, it's a, a universal system that it has, it has a lot of resources at this point. And what we see is that a universal system works much better for wealthier people than it does for poorer people. Because they have all the social capital they need in order to make that system work. That's what it appears. Yeah. yeah. And so we have a massive experiment in a gigantic universal system. 
And it's simply, it, it goes without saying that this is not a system that's working well for, for low, low income people. The research on the impact of child care is very clear that high quality child care is beneficial for disadvantaged children from vulnerable homes. It's not at all clear that high quality child care is necessarily preferable for children from better resourced homes. So the first thing is, we need to be targeting dollars at the least advantaged families, least advantaged children who, who will benefit the most and who need our help the most, the first thing. Second thing is the, the model that I think makes the most sense, which I, I think we've spoken about, the, the Minnesota Early Learning Scholarship Model, gives a voucher, they call it a scholarship, to a family and allows the family to decide what they where what kind of care environment they want to their child to be in. That can be a church basement, that can be a community center. Could it be a neighbor's home? It could be it can be a neighbor's home. It can be it, it's leaving those decisions up to families. The hope is that the kind of the massive institutional failure that I think arguably we see in K twelve won't occur. I also think that public-private partnerships can enable businesses to create child care centers, for example, on site would be absolutely ideal. So there's one example of this, sort of a small example of this. Mississippi has, under Governor uh, Phil Bryant, has done very in, has done very innovative kind of integrating of their workforce development federal funding streams for workforce development and for childcare. So for example, there's a factory in in Mississippi called Milwaukee Tools that was not able to find sufficient workers. He was able to use workforce development money to build a childcare center at his factory and then is using the child care funding streams to help subsidize the care, and then he's putting some of his own money in. So you just look at that situation, right? Most of the workers he has are women, very low-income women in Mississippi. Can you imagine they now are going to a workplace where they can take their baby, they can see their baby at breaks, at lunch, their child knows that they're there. When you describe that, it's an analog to... The earlier yes. pattern of work and childcare, which yes. is bring your kids with you. Exactly. You know, and they're there, they're seeing you, they're, yes. you know, you can come at your lunch break. That seems like a really interesting, it maps better to who we are as people. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's another interesting kind of a, I don't know what you'd call it, maybe a movement that I've just learned about. I'm going to find more out about, I don't know if you've heard of this, called building a maternal economy. And the idea is to develop kind of mechanisms to help particularly women earn a living in ways that, in, in the words of, a, of, of an advocate for this, do not require them to abandon their children. So that can, could be a, a small business collective is one example that I was, I was given tech work. But that the idea is that you create mechanisms that make it easier for this to happen and even encourage it. Yeah. So that people are producing something of value, they're supporting themselves, but to your point, it's consistent with our basic design as humans. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, yeah, I just as you were talking, I was thinking about all of the changes that are going on in the economy, much greater prevalence, obviously, of telecommuting and people having the flexibility to maybe work a few days a week from home, which allows you to to be more present with your with your children. Right. It probably saves quite a bit of money, resources that way that your child care is obviously expensive. Yes. Especially if you're not eligible for public subsidy, you're paying a lot. I remember paying tons for our kids. So. Yep. Yep. And I mean there are obviously a lot of challenges with those kinds of arrangements, mm -hmm. but it does seem to me that it's worth our while to start focusing more on how to make those kinds of things yeah. work. It's not even the long run. I mean, this is something that the business community I found very responsive to. Children are held back in grade, put in special education, starting in kindergarten. 
a large proportion of our over $700 billion cost for the K-12 schools is caught up in reme- essentially remediating the deficits that children have come in with. Yeah, and that's true in the post-secondary world as Correct. well. Correct. It's, it's right? just it's like one long chain of failure. Yeah. And so we will be we don't have to wait until babies are out in the workplace to 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 reap the benefits of this. We will start saving money when they get to kindergarten. I'm always of two minds when it comes to any kind of criticism of the public education system as it relates to these problems. I don't think you can build a public school system strong enough to overcome Correct. the challenges that not children that. and families right. bring with them. That's right. You know, it's just that, not designed so for that. So let's stop blaming public education right. on this. Public education is doing what it does. It works for 80% of the public. Yep. It's good enough. And Not actually 80. Well, whatever about the About half. Is. Yeah. It works well for about half at this okay. point. But, yeah. but that's a lot. Yeah, no, that's, it's that's a lot. That's a right? lot. It's, yep. It might even be a good deal. I don't yep. know. Yep. Uh, yep. But for half, for half the public, it's working really well. But for half the public, it's not only not working well, it's not working, but not because the system. But because of the challenges, again, that the, the children have coming in. So... This is the kind of the getting to the exit question, which is, what do you see sort of on the policy horizon that gives you hope? And also, what's, what do you see that is out there that is really challenging and you think problematic for the direction of the policy discussion around early care? They're kind of two sides of the same coin. What gives me hope is the really remarkable increase in interest and focus and understanding among all kinds of people right. about how important these early years are. Birth to age three development, that's infants and toddlers. And there's an audience of 200 people, mostly guys in suits, who are finding it fascinating. Mm-hmm. And they're correct. It is fascinating. But I it strikes me that this is a fairly new phenomenon, and I'm not actually even sh- sure where it comes from. I think this, the science has played a big role in this, that as we've learned so much over the last 20, 10, even f- five years, I think that has, that's really played a big role in, pe- in people's interest. So people are paying more attention to this. People are kind of primed to be thinking about it, which I think provides an extraordinary opportunity to start thinking about ways to to do it better. That's the one side of it. The other side of it, polarized like so much of our society is today, is what I see as a really dangerous potential for, as you pointed out earlier, the large public institution sort of side of the picture, to utilize that narrative Mm -hmm. to promote what essentially ends could end up being public school for all children starting at birth. And that sounds like such a bizarre and perhaps improbable possibility, but it's actually happening this very moment. Mm. Elizabeth Warren, for example, is proposing her her child care plan proposes funding every single American child full-time, full-day child care in a government-funded center starting at birth. That's massive resources. And all the evidence we have suggests that that will not be positive for children. That's a great place for us to wind up. I share your excitement about the subject matter and the excitement about how excited everybody else is about this, because I think it's so critical to understand. But That excitement can lead us into too much policy on this or the wrong kinds of policy and too much misallocated spending to attempt to address it. So I think those are all really important points. Yeah. And I just I I would just say that I think that the business community has a really important role to play in this because they have their a need for for workers. They understand from a fiscal point of view, that it, it makes sense to target funds at the neediest families. 
I think getting leadership from the business sector in steering this will be enormously valuable. Terrific. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hardly Working. I'm your host, Brent Orell, and I hope you tune in next time to learn more about the state of workforce development in America. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast. Let us know at vocation at AEI.org if there are any topics you'd like us to cover. As always, we hope you find the job that fits so well, it feels like you're hardly working.